Hexagon is a technology company unleashing the power of autonomy to measure and improve what industry needs most. Productivity, efficiency, quality, lower cost, less waste. We believe that industry can save our world, that it can be the solution instead of the problem, and that global commerce is the path to a sustainable planet. Hexagon is intent on making this a reality by putting data to work autonomously to measure progress and improve outcomes. Our technologies digitally capture and measure all things in all places. They position, track and navigate anything. They dimensionally design whatever you want to create, from facilities to evacuation plans. Simulate billions of real-world scenarios. Deliver location intelligence about anything, anywhere. Together, these technologies fuse the physical world with the digital. They empower us to make that giant leap beyond automation to autonomous. 
because autonomy is data doing its best work. Yes, it will drive our cars, yet it will do so much more. It will carefully protect our citizens and nations, operate complex assets and facilities reliably. accurately construct buildings and infrastructure, manufacture products and goods intelligently, responsibly produce from our mines to our farms. Data will do all of these things autonomously. When industry embraces this, sustainable outcomes will follow. Hexagon, empowering an autonomous future. My name is Mike Haywood, I'm a partner of Woodfine Solicitors. We're proud members of the Silverstone Technology Cluster and hopefully this time next year we will celebrate the annual conference in real life. We support businesses in relation to the full range of legal needs here. Hello, I'm Claire Dan, I'm also a partner at Woodfines and I specialise in residential conveyancing. We wish all members a great deal of success in the coming year. We now move on to the third uh, special interest uh, special uh, interest group, which is all about design simulators and metrology, um, which is a fantastic area and certainly in my industry at the moment in, in the travel industry and trains, which sits alongside automotive. Um, we're seeing much of this coming to fore and uh, into the fore. So it's very interesting to hear that we're also concentrating on within the cluster. So first of all, uh, we're going to hear from David Brown from Hexagon, which is also one of our conference supporters, uh, and then Julian Moore, um, who comes from Quantum Technology, and is all about inspiring the next generations of products and services. So I think these will be two fascinating inputs. So I'll now hand over to David. Thank you. Hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm David Brown. I'm the General Manager for Hexagon Metrology Limited, who are part of Manufacturing Intelligence. I wanted to just spend five minutes, if, if I may, just uh, just giving you an insight into what is quite an exciting special interest group here at the STC. 
Uh, it's Design Simulation and Metrology, or DSM for short. So, uh, like, a lot, like a lot of these special interest groups, you, you know, we, we have formed a, uh, a group of people here that are all STC members, uh, of multidiscipline, multi-experience, and very relevant to the special interest group itself. And that's Mike M.C., Paul Kirk, and Rob Lewis, Rob Rousel, and uh, Daniel White. So, to give you an idea, what, what's this about? So really, we're, we're looking, uh, our aim is really to, to accelerate awareness, if you like, of these technology developments across those, those three elements of the manufacturing or design to the manufacturing concept. So engineering, design, simulation, and metrology. You know, it's, um, I think in the past, what we've tended to do is to look at those specialisms. But what we do realize, and that will be as silos, but we do recognize that they, uh, uh, that we want to work and understand how they interact. And those three aspects really do uh, synergize. So we, we very much live, and uh, the driver here is we very much live in a smart factory uh, with data ecosystem. So, so much data uh, through these various processes, both in the virtual world and in the real world. I use this, I use this uh, expression here. So if you create something as a design or you create something in a simulation that's a straight line, it's a perfect mathematical model for a straight line. But we, we all recognize that when we manufactured something, it comes to the real world and invariably there is, uh, there's a variance there. So I guess in a way, you know, what, 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 by having these together, these virtual and real world uh, connections, we understand and start to appreciate the, the dance. So for us, as a, as a group, what we're really driving here, it's about inspiring, informing, exploring, explaining, support, and enabling. And I do, uh, I do highlight that area of adopt. You know, we're in a very big space where we are deluged with technology, and it's really important that we understand what, are we, what can we take and start to adopt in our day-to-day -day world, uh, both in the manufacturing, both as we go to next year and the next 10 years. So it's about getting traction as well. So quick, quick whiz throw in terms of the history. What we recognized back in 2019 is that we, were, we had some specialist groups, but we formed them together. So this is where we brought the design, simulation, metrology, special interest groups together. Then we, uh, then we launched it 26 September last year. This was our, our, our first, first event in this newly formed group. Um, and, and, and the title there was Getting Ready for the Electric Future. Great, great session well attended, really good speakers, and it really did stimulate some, uh, some good insights and thought-provoking discussion. Then we moved, uh, same year, uh, last year as well, end of last year, 10th of December, we again hosted an event at Black uh, and Milton Keynes. And this was about, uh, again, exploring the technologies and the processes which uh, are really set and uh, aiming there to set the business of the future. Then as we move into uh, into this year, into this strange environment we found ourselves in, in the virtual world, of course, we had what was quite a very good and relevant topic, which was about funding. Uh, lots, of, uh, lots of opportunity out there, but also lots of challenges around how you get it and who's best and first at post to, to really get those. So the workshop really allowed that little bit of steering to make sure that who, uh, whoever is there can get the best chance of success. And then, of course, the, the big pitch here is that we, we do have one. Uh, we, we, we have our next session on the 8th of December, which isn't far away. Please join us if you, if you feel you have a relevance in this uh, interest group. And, and really, this is about exploring, again, post-pandemic. Post and it's changed a lot in terms of business thinking. Definitely, businesses are really putting their foot on the accelerator. They're seeing that they need to change, they need to adapt. They need to diversify. So, so this is a great opportunity to get some insights into that, uh, into those various areas. So again, this is ultimately the, the emotion that we uh, and, and the feelings that we want to really stimulate within the group. Okay, so that was a, a quick tour. Uh, what, what I'd like to do now is, uh, if I may, just hand over to Julian Moore, who's the Business Engagement Manager for the CM Project at uh, Birmingham University. Okay, thank you, and everyone enjoy the rest of the, the rest of the conference. Good morning to you all. My name is Julian Moore, and I'm the Business Engagement Manager at the University of Birmingham. 
I'm really delighted to be part of the Silverstone Technology Cluster Annual Conference and hopefully over the next 15 minutes or so I'll be giving you a brief overview about quantum technologies and in particular focusing on some of the inspiring next generation products and services that we are seeing coming through the wonderful research and investigation that's been done by a number of uh, leading organisations uh, involved in the quantum technology space. So before I do anything else, I just wanted to start with an opening thought. Now, please don't think I'm being remiss in terms of, you know, not being empathetic of the challenges that business and industry has been through over the past how many months because of COVID-19. But I know that a practitioner within leadership, John Maxwell, always speaks about the importance of trying to find opportunities within adversity. And the quote from Business Matters really mentions it's the importance of embracing emerging and disruptive technologies before it's too late and you miss that chance for competitive advantage. So I just thought I'd start by setting the scene uh, with this quote. So what I'll be doing over the next 15 minutes is a brief overview to quantum technologies, highlight the work that's being done within the United Kingdom and the progress that has been made to date, uh, looking at the kind of structure through the UK National Quantum Technologies Programme and demonstrating the great potential which we are seeing through next-gen products and services, hopefully in a position where basically commercialisation will take place and you will start to see some new technology coming through, which is going to enable us to do things differently uh, in a much better way. Uh, profile the University of Birmingham Cayenne Project. So basically, how can your business get involved in these projects and how it can help you to basically get involved in this space and to explore basically how you could do things differently and innovate. So I may have some quantum technology practitioners amongst us. Again, for those, uh, please forgive me, but uh, just running over a few details for those that are perhaps not in the know. Uh, so quantum theory is one of the most significant breakthroughs of the 20th century. So we've seen the rise and development of widely used technologies, including the transistor and the laser. But with quantum, we've seen a new generation of possibilities, which is really driving uh, and enabling uh, some previously impossible devices and systems to actually come to the fore. And these developments are really going to help to improve the accuracy of measuring. So it's all around measuring uh, time, freque uh, frequency, rotation, magnetic fields, and also gravity. So taking that one stage further, how is quantum technology different? So a lot of today's devices uh, and electronics, communications, they're all being built around electrons. And we've reached the stage where we've kind of like mastered this technology. Electrons, as we know, are little, they're nimble, but they are really holding us back and restricting how fast and small we can make electronics in the future. The solution, I believe, is quantum. So quantum, uh, the new physics, is basically dealing with tiny any energy levels of atoms and subatomic particles. So if you just look at the diagram uh, on the, the PowerPoint slide, is that it's about how we can manipulate these atoms uh, by using laser technology. You know, quantum technology really relies on the behavior of microscopic particles, which can be in two places at once, and as such become very sensitive to the differences between those places. So that's where we get the unique opportunity to, to achieve measurement and accuracy never experienced before. So like everybody else, I'm truly excited about the potential that we are seeing through quantum technology. Quantum technology in the UK is backed by a full program and we have a number of leading uh, organizations that are involved as you see the logos on the slide uh, in front of you. Uh, lots of companies that are basically passionate and have harnessed and seen the potential for quantum and basically they're really passionate about science and technology and the advancement of technology for the better of society. So we all come together, we all play a leading role along with a number of other companies, organisations that have also got a vetted interest in how we can shape and form quantum technologies for the future. This is just a bit of background. So again, we're not talking about something which has just recently started, you know, going back to as early as 2013, 2014, that's when the first phase of the UK National Quantum Technologies Programme actually begun uh, with funding to support the development work of four hubs across the UK. 
Uh, we went through that successfully, had a wonderful uh, celebration event, but there's more to be done. So we are greatly appreciative that further funding has been afforded for another five years to basically see how we can move forward and really try to realize the commercialization potential for new products utilizing quantum technology. So just for information, the four hubs that I mentioned, uh, you've got Sensors and Timing Hub, uh, which is led by the University of Birmingham, and I'll share more about some of their activities later on. Uh, the Quantum Enhanced Imaging Hub, uh, led by the University of Glasgow, uh, Quantum Computing Simulation, uh, led by University of Oxford, and also Quantum Communications Technologies, led by the University of York. So going back to the University of Birmingham, so we lead the technology hub for sensors and timing. And as you can see on the slide, there are a number of other universities. So Strathclyde, uh, Nottingham, Glasgow, Sussex, Southampton, and a whole range of other organizations, MPL and, and others that you see on the screen that are involved in, in this space of sensors and timing. You know, the real focus for what we're trying to achieve is to take the wonderful learnings and, and realizations that we're seeing within the laboratory into real world situations that can basically help solve, you know, societal and environmental challenges. There's massive opportunity, you know, we're hoping that we are on the cusp of building what we become a, a 1 billion industry in this new sector over the next few decades through the application of quantum technology. Uh, within the hub, you know, we're focused more so on the quantum technology sensor side of things and also the massive opportunity that we have through quantum navigation. Now, you might think, OK, well, I'm not involved in those kind of like very niche uh, sectors or so. How is quantum going to be relevant to me? Well, for us to do what we do within the laboratory and also to start taking forward uh, developments and enhancements, we need a supply chain. So a supply chain of companies that are involved in special these lasers and design, high vacuum equipment, electronic control systems, and also photon detectors. So what you now see is the uh, opportunity for an emergent supply chain of, of, of companies, of, of organizations that have got expertise that can help underpin the strides that we are looking to make within quantum technology. And we do indeed strive to lead the quantum revolution. So back in June 2020, uh, the government awarded 38 further new projects uh, that will benefit from a further 70 million government investment to power quantum technology across the UK. Uh, we're also involved in a number of groundbreaking quantum tech projects, uh, which will help to speed up things such as the uh, diagnosis of cancerous tumours during surgery and detect industrial gas leaks uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emission. This funding pot of 1 billion from government and industry uh, invested to commercialize quantum innovations will definitely help to secure the UK status as a world leader within this space. And that's just a slide that really articulates all of the kind of messaging, the, the different reports that you hear, you know, across the globe uh, of, of many other sorts of countries that are involved in this quantum revolution. So the theme and the title of the presentation was about, you know, what is quantum doing to potentially inspire the next generation of products and services? So over the next few slides, you'll see some of the, the areas that we've been involved in at the University of Birmingham and how it's really changing or potentially going to change the way that we've traditionally gone about delivering products and services. So to start with, you look at the, the area of wanting to know basically what's going on on the ground, underneath the ground which have really come to the fore when you're talking about, you know, these construction uh, projects that are undertaken and surveyors that basically want to know what's going on before, you know, expensive projects are under, under, underway. So as you can see, you know, we've got ground penetrating radar, we've got magnetometers, but again, if you look at the person with the device there, it's quite bulky, it's quite big, and you also have a range of uh, microgravity uh, applications and products as well. What we've seen with these are, limitations, the fact that, you know, many are undetectable, you know, we can't see a lot of the unforeseen ground conditions, which actually align beyond the detection capability of these geophysical techniques. So there are shortfalls, there are limitations. So the question is, how can quantum technology help overcome some of these challenges? What we've been doing at the Quantum Technology Hub at the University of Birmingham is basically looking at how we can harness the power of gravity sensors. So as I mentioned before, the unique 
aspects of quantum is about how you can measure and, and, and have atoms in two places at the one time. And that gives, you know, extra notion to, to look at, you know, really accurate measurements to give fantastic results. And as it's got here on the slide, to see the invisible, uh, which has previously been impossible. So we are on a journey, you know, going from the gravity imagery one uh, picture that you see there, which is a massive uh, component uh, with supporting flight case or so. We've been looking at how we can harness drone technology and actually fly atoms to do surveying. But then the goal is to get to a kind of like a, a can-sized demonstrator, a model, which has got all of the components inside, and that would make things a lot more effective in terms of measurement and a lot more pleasing on the eye as well. So there are lots of scope and, and, and potential for, you know, sectors such as agri-tech, uh, architecture, construction, and civil engineering. In the medical field, uh, MRI systems, you know, we know that they are used widely, but they also have their deficiencies. And, you know, potentially through the work we are doing, we're looking at ways that we can overcome that uh, through quantum technology. So this slide, and again, working very closely with the University of Nottingham, we've started to really advance and look at how we can use a new generation of quantum sensors, uh, which have enabled us to actually go from these big bulky MRI systems to producing something which is more portable, uh, could basically be more positioned on, on the brain, uh, because we know with the brain, you've got the skull, and the skull you know, in itself is, is something that needs to be overcome because it's blocking out the magnetic signals uh, that can be picked up and the, the electrical currents of the brain. So this slide really demonstrates the evolution that we've been on to actually produce something which can be wearable, but not just used by adults, but also by pediatrics as well. As you can see, the first pediatric helmet uh, was, was created in 2019. So just really covering and summarizing what I've just said, you know, what this is doing is opening opportunities for more wearable uh, devices that can be adaptable to any shape or size of head, it's giving better and higher spatial resolution uh, and also cheaper, uh, which is always great. Uh, so there is plenty of scope for magnetic sensors, which have got that ability to really be precise enough to pick up those tiny magnetic fields. So we are working closely. It's, it's a major work plan as part of our program and the University of Nottingham are really doing some fantastic innovative things uh, within this space. You could move on looking at sort of like the potential for drone technologies. So again, you know, there are expected to be 29 million drones by 2021. Lots of things within airspace. So again, we need to be sensing small objects within the air. There's also great potential for sensing position and movement as well. And looking at some of the deficiencies from today's satellite navigation systems. So that just really summarizes the, the point that I've just made. Uh, the fact that, you know, there is a major loss to the economy uh, when there is outages for GNSS. Uh, also, autonomous shipping, you know, poses new uh, navigation challenges as well. So I suppose what I'm saying here is that we've been exploring what the next generation of product could be uh, that would help with navigation. And again, that all really becomes a reality through the development of optical clocks, uh, which basically with a thousand to 10,000 times higher precision. So again, things such as automotive computing, you're looking at the financial sector that needs a, a time stamp for transactions, quantum could really come to the fore in this area as well. That's just a further demonstration about the importance of quantum sensors uh, in positioning, navigation and timing. So what you're seeing here is lots of scope and lots of opportunity, which we are on the journey to and hopefully lead to commercialization of a range of new new products and services. That's just demonstrating that potential is growing. So lots of opportunity across a range of different sector areas. And then also, you know, it's very interesting to see some of the core areas such as like communications, transport, infrastructure, but then seeing how the work we've been doing around gravity, magnetic sensing, cross cuts a lot of these uh, sensor areas. So for me, there is wonderful opportunity and potential for quantum technologies to really you know, you know, do things differently and inspire businesses to think on a different level to, to address some of the common problems that we are seeing in today's society. So really getting to the point of how can a business get involved? So the Cayenne project was really set up uh, a couple of years ago. So we launched back in uh, 2018 and it's to help small businesses to really understand how they can harness the, 
the power, the abilities, the unique uh, attributes of quantum technology to help overcome a range of measurement uh, related challenges. Kayam can help businesses through a number of different ways. It, it's all about really exploration, collaboration, and research. So through our quantum technology hub, we have a number of leading academics and professionals that are involved in quantum uh, technology investigation work. So you have basically all of this knowledge and specialism to access and to harness. You know, it's, it's about support, it's about network. The fact that the University of Birmingham leads uh, the work within sensors and timing gives a wonderful opportunity for us to you know, share some of our contacts and to, to help support you on your respective journey. We have a number of Knowledge Exchange Fellows. So we have Dr. Sun, who's uh, part of the team. She has uh, a background in some of the areas that you see on the screen here. And again, you have access to all of this. You know, she is only basically a Skype call, a, a Zoom call away, and we are happy to impart our knowledge to help see businesses actually move forward. The same with Dr. Archie Cuber as well, done a lot of work around magnetic shield design and testing, uh, which is particularly important uh, within the area of med, med tech and, and, and healthcare. How we deliver our support. So normally a minimum of two days, so 12 hours, uh, and that's pre-funded. So it's not going to cost you anything. We add a state aid value to the project also or area of support that has been identified. And we cover all of those different things there. So in this current climate, it's more about online demonstrations, masterclasses and webinars. Uh, we offer coaching, support, consultation, but also, you know, access to, to our network as well. So, you know, it's, it's a very, very uh, relevant and very supportive scheme that will help your organisation to move forward. So eligibility, again, in terms of the local area, the scheme was initially meant for businesses, SME businesses within the Greater Birmingham and Solihull Local Enterprise Partnership area, as you can see depicted on the uh, the geographical map uh, on the screen. But again, if you are based outside, if you're a larger organization, please don't think we can't help. You know, there are different ways that we can support you. So please do get in touch. Uh, there's, there's always a way to, to move forward and support you as best we can. So in finishing off, uh, these are just uh, an articulation of some of the areas that we've supported. So oil and gas, uh, health and med tech, uh, the automotive sector have benefited from our research, uh, the telecommunications sector, uh, the care homes and, and energy efficiency, uh, and also civil engineering and construction. You know, we've worked with nearing 30 businesses uh, over the duration of the projects who have basically been able to harness our knowledge and support and go and achieve fantastic things. So my question to you in conclusion is, are you ready to make your quantum leap? We make it very simple. All you do is note my contact details there, Drop me an email, give me a call, and I'd be happy to set up an exploratory discussion uh, where we can see, you know, what your aspirations are, where you might have specific challenges around measurement, and how basically we can share with everything that I've told you about today to basically help you to improve and basically to move forward uh, with your particular projects and uh, organisation. So thanking you so much for, for listening. I hope that has given you an overview that quantum technologies within the UK is really, really moving forward to massive proportions, and it would be great to help support you and your business on this particular journey. So thank you for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. That was really useful. Thank you, Julian and David. Um, we've got a couple of questions, which um, I think would be worth looking at first. Um, when can we expect quantum technologies to be mainstream and widely available? Um, and what are the bridging technologies in the meantime? Okay, thanks, Helen. Uh, in terms of time frames, again, that's always a question which comes to the fore. Uh, we've obviously been doing a lot of work over the past five years or so, but people want to get to the nitty gritty in terms of when we're actually going to see uh, these products actually come to the fore. Uh, there are a number of areas which I've obviously covered and progress is being made uh, at different rates in these different work packages. But, you know, in some areas, you may be thinking kind of like, you know, we're five years away. In some other areas, it might be 10 years away. But the main thing is that we're obviously making significant process with the, the research side of things and proof of concepts. And that's where obviously a lot of the funding calls are coming to the fore, which will allow organizations to really either partner up or do things themselves to really help to drive things forward. So it's always the kind of key question that we get at every single meeting, every single for forum, 
it's hard to obviously put a time frame, but sort of within the next, you know, three, four, five years, we're actually going to start to see some real products come to the fore from a covert commercialization perspective. Uh, David, I think uh, anything you want to add in terms of that at all? Um, fine, if not. No, uh, um, no, no. Maybe just a very a, a brief overview, really. Yeah, I mean, great presentation from Julian, and, and I think that gives us good insight there into uh, what, what I call it almost moving into the next industrial revolution. So, quite a powerful, powerful insight there in topic. Yeah, really, look, I think this, uh, what, what's been interesting so far uh, from the morning sessions, there is some common thread that's running through uh, around some of the messaging and the dynamic that we're pushing through into this uh, to this community. So it's really good to see it. Yeah. It did occur to me, David, on that point, that there was real linkage between the first SIG in terms of the future of mobility and autonomy and some of the work that Julian's describing. Certainly, if we were to do a connected autonomous train, we'd have to think very hard about safety. And actually, I think quantum um, could be one of the ways to release that technology. So I think the linkages we're seeing around the park are fantastic. Yeah. Thank yeah. you both very much uh, for that, those two presentations. Um, what I'd like to do now is to move on uh, and welcome our next guest speaker, Hannah Ingram-Moore from Matrix. Um, Hannah is going to speak to us about gender equality in the workplace. And um, this is something that she's a real expert on. Um, and I'm for which sure we will find... Um, very useful. So if I can hand over to Hannah, please. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. The subject of gender equality is one that I am extremely passionate about. I would like to take you this short presentation today. From an early age, I was brought up to believe that all people are equal, whatever gender, background or colour of their skin. My father and mother instilled in me that my sister and I could do whatever we wanted in life. There were no boundaries. And then I started working. It was a total surprise to me at the start of my career just how many blocks there were to gender equality in the workplace. Over the years, businesses have become more aware of its significance, but it is only inching forward, not leaping. What we are doing is not enough. We're all responsible as leaders to ensure that gender equality is ingrained into the fabric of our business. Equality at work and in life should be a given, not a bonus. In this short talk today, I'm going to touch upon the first findings of a white paper that the team at Matrix is putting together. Every day, Matrix works with a range of organizations from giant corporates to SMEs in every sector. We look at how to get the best from their teams, how to develop a company, and most recently, how to rebuild the bones of a business that had been crushed under the weight of the pandemic. The idea of the white paper came about following the recent gender equality event run by the committee of Silverstone Technology Cluster. The session, which I was honored to take part in, looked at how we close the gap, how we ensure that we are paid equally and that harassment at work, which is still happening despite our beliefs that we are forward thinking country is eliminated. So what are the actual blocks to moving us forward in gender equality? We'll see how some are harder to move, but there is one that we can easily push aside because it's a block that shouldn't be there at all. Who does gender equality relate to? It's not just about men and women being treated the same at work because we have to conform. It's understanding the knock-on effect that gender equality has in a very positive way for organizations. As Mike Honda said, equal pay isn't just a women's issue. When women get equal pay, their family incomes rise and the whole family benefits. However, gender equality is not just about pay. It's about every single person that works being looked at by their business as equal because they bring their skills, knowledge and life experience to make the company thrive. Whether it will be ensuring that they have the best career opportunities or the flexibility and assurance that they can work and look after their children without backlash or hindrance. Gender equality is not just a legality. It's about consciously embracing the diversity we have at work and then using our differences to join forces and improve, not hinder our business. Gender equality is an issue that affects us all. As former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan highlighted, gender equality is not just a box we need to tick. It is how we will overcome the barriers that we still come up against. It will allow us to stamp out poverty, to become more sustainable, and to be a world full of people genuinely governing for good. Research has shown that not to embrace gender equality is damaging businesses in so much that we don't actually realize the positive effect it could have. 
This manifests itself in several ways, seven of which I've highlighted here. Focused and productive. According to the European Institution for Gender Equality, improvements in gender equality will lead to an additional 10.5 million jobs by 2050, which will benefit both men and women. Simply having more women in, in industries in which they have been underrepresented, such as STEM, will bring a fresh perspective, which will ensure that we move to a more productive country. As anyone who has read Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez, will appreciate everything we are surrounded by from the size of our phones to the height of our desks fundamentally comes from the measurements of the average male. Think about that when you're juggling the phone or finding the seatbelt uncomfortable. Ideas and innovation. Imagine a room full of men in a creative agency discussing a product being targeted simply at women. That would be insane, wouldn't it? And yet it happens more than you can think. Only by including as much diversity as possible in our teams can we be sure to understand our markets, feel what our customers feel, and accelerate innovation without actually putting that much effort into it. If you had the opportunity to surround yourself by people who understood an issue firsthand, why wouldn't you let them in the room? Better quality of life, more flexible working, happy and engaged workforce. Gender equality is not a women's issue. It is the path to achieving the perfect work-life balance for us all. It would mean everyone being able to share childcare, for example, without penalty. It is acknowledging that shared responsibilities lead to a happier workforce, which in turn leads to better results. There are simple ways to make this happen. It won't cost companies much other than being more flexible and really listening to what the team needs to be more productive. Attract and retain the best talent. We are now, thanks to the pandemic, in a crisis situation with unemployment. There are more people than ever looking for work. The necessity of redundancies has less to retain, led to retain staff having more pressure put upon them. They need to juggle home life with work and keep their salaries means that resentment can start to build. By understanding the pressures that the pandemic has thrown upon us, we will also exist long term. We can work out how to keep the people we need in our businesses. Additionally, by showing the world that we work in this way, we are flexible, understanding and supportive. We have the best shot window to attract like minded, intelligent people who want to be in our organisations and profitability. A happy, respected workforce will bring better financial results. It's as simple as that. Where in the world are we doing it best? Which countries have been consciously trying to move towards gender equality? According to the 2020 Global Gender Gap Index, collated by the World Economic Forum, you will see that it's Northern Europe that's leading the way. But sadly, for such a progressive country, the United Kingdom is not close to making the top 10. And that is not to say that Iceland is the perfect model. They have been in the number one slot for almost a decade, but they themselves admit they have a long way to go. We all do. Alarmingly, results show that globally, the rate at which we are progressing with gender equality today is so slow that it will take as Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum highlights here, around another 100 years before we're even close to two gender, true gender equality. Soberingly, this means in our lifetime, it's unlikely we will see that change. Let's make, make it our mission though. Let's try to move the blocks away. So what are they? There are many, but the four main barriers to progress with gender equality at this very moment are unconscious bias, government spend, the pandemic, and the motivation by individual organizations to truly embrace gender equality. Let's look at each of these areas briefly in turn, see how it affects us and what we can do to make change. First is unconscious bias. This is a tricky one to quash because despite our best efforts, we are force fed stereotypes everywhere we go. As Plato so eloquently put, we need to start teaching women the same subjects if we want them to excel in the same jobs. And this applies to men too. A few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Dr. Christiana Pache of the Silverstone Tech Cluster Committee about her communication with her son's school because he was not allowed to play netball. The school said this was because it was a sport for girls. Christiana put her case forward and as a result, her son is now playing netball and doing well. Imagine if she had just left it. What message would that have given her son and his friends? 
What happens to all the children of parents who don't feel they have a voice? How much young talent will never be seen because of casual inequality in education? So it starts with school, but you'll see that inequality hits us much earlier. Rosberg, chair of the Silverstone Tech Cluster, pointed this out recently. Next time you go to a big supermarket, look at the clothes for children. Girls are sweet and sparkly, and boys get to try different careers to save people as superheroes. So I did a quick Google search, looking at what the internet, our main source of information, suggested children would like when dressing up. Ros was absolutely right. From childhood, we are unconsciously absorbing the stereotype that retailers are promoting. That's not to say that we want to boycott the sparkle. We just want girls to see that they too can be astronauts and scientists and use their brains and their skills, not just wave a magic wand. I believe that we need to lobby as businesses and families for more government support with childcare. Women in Iceland, for example, are highly educated, a high percentage hold managerial positions, and they don't give up their careers to have children. They're able to manage both, like the country's prime minister who has three young sons. It's been an issue they've fought for. For example, on the 24th of October, 1975, women of Iceland refused to go to work. They refused to cook, clean, or look after their children. In fact, they went on strike. Two years ago, Iceland became the first country in the world to make companies prove that they're not paying women less than men for the same work. Employers rushed to comply with the new rules to avoid fines. Companies and government agencies with more than 25 staff had to obtain government certification of their equal pay policies. However, childcare is an issue that the UK does not take that seriously. Women in the UK can take 12 months off work after having a baby. However, the father can only take two weeks. Currently, maternity and paternity leave in Iceland is 10 months with equal rights for the mother and father. As of the 1st of January 2021, the maternity and paternity leave will be extended to 12 months. Extending the same benefits to both parents regarding maternity and paternity leave is an essential step towards gender equality. It allows each parent to be comfortable with child rearing, encouraging them to share the workload with their partners. The UK does not see childcare as anything other than a women's issue. We as a society do not value the significance it makes to our economy by allowing talented women back into the workplace after having children. We do not seem to acknowledge that childcare is so expensive that women are forced to stay at home and give up their careers altogether or try to somehow juggle work and a home on a much lower salary. Here is what the Prime Minister of Iceland has to say about what they found government spend is best placed when it comes to gender equality. We are all aware that for decades to come, we will be paying heavily for the devastating effect the pandemic has had on the country. Our children, and no doubt their children, will be paying phenomenal taxes to try to ease the mountain of debt. However, before COVID swept, away, swept its way through the world, government spend was still a big part of what is blocking gender equality at work. To make gender equality a reality, there has to be a good level of government investment to help businesses. The pandemic has had a devastating effect on the workplace and recent research undertaken by McKinsey and Co shows that women are having to adapt their company roles, often having to leave them because of the knock-on effect that COVID-19 has had on their lives. Not only are people losing their jobs because industries such as retail and hospitality were hit so badly, but those still able to work are struggling because of home life. And this can lead to forced reduction in hours, having to take a less demanding role, taking a long period of time off work, moving from full-time to part-time, and unfortunately for many, it means having no choice but to leave their job altogether. So unconscious bias, government spend, and the pandemic are all huge blocks and ones that are harder for us to make an impact on. Yes, we can ask that our children are treated equally with Christmas gifts. We can suggest they are included in all subjects at school. We can petition the government to give us better childcare rights. We can do all we can to support employees during and after the pandemic, but they are small steps. However, the one block that we can all move is our own company's implementation of gender equality. We do that already, you cry. Is it official though? Are your employees aware of their rights? Do they know what everyone is earning? Do they know what is and is not acceptable behavior? How many people sitting here today can say, hand on heart, they have a watertight gender equality policy or a charter that they've drawn up with their team? If you have, do your suppliers and clients know? Do they follow your own policies? Are you shouting this from the rooftops to retain and attract talent? Well, we did some research to find out. 
Thanks to Jackie and Pim at Silverstone Technology Cluster, we sent out a survey about gender equality to all the members of the group. And our first acknowledgement was how few members actually replied. We didn't expect everyone to complete the survey, especially those smaller businesses. However, there are huge organisations, including banks, councils and manufacturers on the members list, and we had just 3% response. That in itself speaks volumes. This is not finger pointing. It's simply a reflection of the reality. Apathy. As the small number of responses we received shows, gender equality, despite a company's best intentions, is not high on its list of priorities. Of course, we are in a horrifying, turbulent pandemic period. Our businesses are trying to survive, but gender equality, as we've seen, is one way to get us back on track. Knowledge. If you were to create a charter tomorrow, who would you turn to to help create it? How do you know that this charter is legal? Does it cover everything it should? It can be overwhelming and much easier to put it on the list and then allow it to drop to the bottom. Communication. How do you tell employees what their gender equality rights are at work? Does it seem ridiculous to bring it up at interview stage? Or would it make you look as if you genuinely cared? If there is a policy, how often is it re referred to? Are you aware of any harassment at work? What would the process be if someone was being spoken to in a way that was inappropriate? Would they fear for their jobs if they spoke out? And what if the person who was inappropriate was in fact their own line manager? Execution. For all the reasons above, companies still stall when it comes to creating their own charter. Yet this policy and reference could be the difference to increase productivity and profitability in your business. This job does not fall solely on the shoulders of the management. This is something that the entire company can embrace, own and promote. If companies do not have a charter or policy, they then they cannot expect employees to know where they stand when it comes to gender equality. We also asked if companies would like more women in C-suite positions. Are they aware of any issues of harassment at work? And if so, were they dealt with appropriately? We are sending out the survey to other sectors of industry too, and the anonymous, anonymous results will be available in our white paper that will be released towards the end of December this year. However, whether you feel that this applies to you or not, it is the responsibility of every leader to ensure that there is official recognition of gender equality at work. So here, to conclude, I've listed 12 simple steps that companies can take to lead them to gender equality in the workplace. We will list them in detail in the white paper, but as a quick overview, I'll just focus on a few now. Be honest with yourself and review your approach to gender equality. If you don't know how to proceed, ask an external specialist. Look at the management team, ask them their opinion, give them and their team's ownership without burden. Look at all the job specs and policies you have on file. Do they stand up to what's expected from businesses now? Yes. Look at how you can create a fantastic work-life balance for employees. Ask them what they Quiet. need and see how you can help deliver. Finally, what do we do now? Simply put, we live and breathe gender equality. We acknowledge the positive effect it has for all of us, both at work and home. Let's unite as business leaders to put gender equality at the top of our agendas. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation today. I hope it's given you some interesting insight and I look forward to speaking to you all later. Hannah, that was fabulous as always. Um, a really great practical approach to resolving the issues around gender equality in the workplace. Um, it's quite interesting that there have been a number of comments about, particularly about the toys. Um, I think Carl made a point, you know, the, the stereotyping at Christmas shopping is a nightmare in terms of toys for girls and toys for boys. And it, it all starts at home. Um, certainly my father was a scientist and did the same as yours, said there was no barriers. But if you don't get that lucky start in life, then unfortunately it falls to, to later on the workplace and at school. Um, Jenny asks, I'll be further interested to talk to you on this subject um, and she's interested in following that up. Um, I think in terms of um, your, your uh, comments, uh, Hannah, I think actually one of the questions that I have is, do you truly believe that COVID-19 is going to make the situation worse and set us back in terms of that whole transformation 
Um, and is there anything specifically we should be doing to try and draw people's attention to that? Um, unfortunately, I do believe that is the case. I think it's already happening. Um, all the statistics show us that is the case. Um, that uh, women are already uh, being pushed back into more domesticated roles, that they're already the ones um, not taking exercise as they would have done. So it, tragic as it is, it's, it's stepping us back. And in fact, something just popped up, popped up on my news feed to say that our current situation um, will mean that we go backwards um, as far as gender equality goes by significant amounts of time, which is uh, incredibly distressing. Um, I think that what we all must do as business leaders is look very um, inwardly at ourselves and um, understand what it is that we are doing, because it's one thing to say, yes, yes, we believe um, in gender equality, but what are we doing? So look inside our businesses, we all own it. And uh, I think this is not, um, to, I'm not looking at all the men here, I'm looking at us all. We all have a responsibility. Look around us. What positive inroads and uh, can we make to ensuring that the women in our business coming up through the ranks, the ones who are already there, are secure, have a pathway that the blocks are removed. Some of those blocks are just so easy. Look at the unconscious bias. Um, it, it's simply there and we just don't know we're doing it. So I, I think put it on the table. Let's not be uncomfortable about it. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and a, a final comment from, from Roz that I absolutely endorse. To grow our businesses, we need to check that our businesses are fit for purpose to attract and retain uh, appropriate staff. And, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Margaret has one other question for you. Do you have any data on the informal networking channels, both within or without an organisation, where often more traditional networking activities are not necessarily gender inclusive, um, e.g. tickets to mixed uh, sport matches, etc.? And well, we don't, I don't have it at my fingertips, but for sure it's all of the things that we're looking at. So perhaps, Margaret, we can take that um, offline and we can um, talk to you directly. Lovely. Uh, and one from Jahi. Um, why do you think the current situation is setting gender equality backwards? I think it's um, as simple as being forced back into working at home often for many people. I mean, I have to say, I'm lucky my office is 20 paces from my house. I get to leave. But for um, all of those people, many of you, I think, who are now working in their living rooms, um, that it naturally, that your children have been at home and our natural way that our society is, is that the women are picking up more um, childcare related uh, domestic duties. Fact. Absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And you can see it across the working environment. Okay, well, thank you very much, Hannah. That was um, very inspirational, very useful and very practical in its approach. Um, what we're thank now you. going to do is we're going to start. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, we're now going to start. Um, we've, we're restarting our session this afternoon with the Right Honourable Andrea Lebson MP uh, for uh, South Northamptonshire, where she's been the MP for 2010, which is the area of the Silverstone uh, cluster. Um, Andrea has had a sterling career with so many important roles, including Secretary of State, Bayes, the, and working on the industrial strategy, which was uh, absolutely, in my opinion, one of the best documents I've ever seen. Uh, she was also leader of the House of Commons. So welcome, Andrea. Um, we, we really are glad that you've managed to find some time to spend with us. Um, we understand you're going to talk a little bit about the government perspective, which we're very much looking forward to. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me. Great pleasure to be here. I thought I would just cover off three things. Obviously, we had the spending review yesterday, which I'm sure will be of, of significant interest to colleagues on the call. And then perhaps a bit about Brexit, which um, still continues to be out there. And, um, and then the final thing is about the future, how the UK makes our way in the world. Um, so we're all kind of high politics, if you'll forgive me, but then I am an MP. But first of all, I just want to say a huge thank you, because I know that the Silverstone Technology Cluster really did seek to contribute very significantly to the COVID work over this last year. And I know from making sanitizers to mechanical ventilators and all sorts of ideas for um, different contributions to the effort, um, your group has been a very significant player. So thank you for that. But um, first up, the spending review yesterday, what um, the Chancellor set out was quite how bad the situation is. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that that will not be lost on any of you. 
but just a few headline figures. Um, this year, the Office for Budget Responsibility predicts that we will borrow just under £400 billion of excess over our tax take. And that is a phenomenal sum. That is the, um, the, the largest peacetime and in 300 years amount relative to the size of our economy. And what it does mean is that over the next few years, our debt is going to remain stubbornly and increasingly close to 100% of GDP, which is pretty disastrously eye-watering. And not only that, but the OBR suggests that this year our economy will have dropped by over 11% by the end of the year, and it will take until the end of 2022 to make good that loss. They are predicting a 6% rise next year and a 5% the following year. Now, that sort of should tell us a few things. I mean, obviously, economic forecasts are only that. But nevertheless, for me, as someone who was very much um, around in the financial crisis in finance, what that says to me is this is very different from the 2008-9 financial crisis where globally jobs and wealth were really destroyed, businesses were destroyed, and it was a very long-term scarring experience for many. And what central bankers had to do was to bail out the banking system, yes, but also to drop interest rates to significantly historically low levels in order to avoid mass unemployment. And what's happened this time around is a very, very sharp retraction as a result of having to virtually close our economy overnight. But what it also means is that people who've not actually lost their jobs or their businesses, which is a big if, but those who haven't, the demand, the desire to be out there, to be spending money, going on holiday, seeing friends, going out for dinner and so on, will result in quite a significant boost once, when and if this vaccine makes our lives able to return to normal. So in a sense, we've got the disastrous position right now of the um, coronavirus pandemic continuing and meaning that we're still incurring excess costs to pay for it, but at the same time, the prospect of quite a swift recovery. And so there are opportunities for us to consider as we go forward. So in terms of where we are right now, there's obviously no easy choices. You either grow your economy or you raise taxes or you cut spending. And the Chancellor is going to have to make some of those decisions, but as clearly set out, not quite yet. So he's taken some modest decisions, like, as we know, um, reducing the percentage of GNI that's spent on overseas development. That's something I personally regret um, myself. Um, you, you may have other views. But also, very importantly, is freezing public sector pay, except for those in the NHS on the front line and for those on the lowest incomes. And that is a matter of fairness. That does reflect the fact that in the private sector, people's jobs have been lost. They've been furloughed on 80% of pay. Real pay has dropped this year. And that has been a very tough and unfair division between those in the private sector and those in the public sector. So that's a very modest decision. And of course, we're already seeing just 24 hours on the sort of political ramifications of that. So, um, you know, it's very easy to kind of say, well, in my day, but actually, we're now going to see, of course, the same as we saw in 2009, 2010, where people will the end. They want us to get our fiscal position back in, a, in order, but they don't will the means. They don't want to see cuts in spending and they certainly don't want to see rises in taxes. But these are the choices that and or growing the economy. It will be a combination of all three. So we've got a difficult time ahead of us. And as Rishi said yesterday, the economic crisis is only just starting. But I think another point that is worth bearing in mind is that as we move forward, um, provided we put in place the means by which to recover, then we can help to facilitate a much faster recovery. And that's what we all hope to do. And so some of the headlines from yesterday are another £55 billion to be spent on dealing with the pandemic. So that means paying for vaccines, PPE, etc., just dealing with the consequences of what we still currently face. As and when that vaccine comes online, hopefully um, we will be able to start returning to normal next Easter. I mean, I don't want to be 
overly optimistic about it, but I certainly do think that we are now in a position to be able to talk about lives returning back to normal. And I suspect that there is then a following wind for really quite significant economic bounce in the um, three, the, the third three quarters of next year, should that vaccine prove to be successful. And then the following year will we'll still be with a following wind. So that's the protecting lives and livelihoods. I think the second item that, um, that the Chancellor announced yesterday is that of protecting public services. So there were a number of announcements and commitments that were made following the years of trying to sort ourselves out from the last financial crisis. So that 10 years of what became known as austerity, which was, in my view, far from austerity, it was merely trying to cap some of the extraordinary rises in costs that we'd had during the Labour years. So that period of what became known as austerity was designed to get our fiscal position back on an even keel, and it did indeed do that. And that is why we are now able to tackle something like almost 400 billion of borrowing and actually not struggle as a result from an international credibility perspective. So that investment in public services that was pledged in the Conservative General Election Manifesto will continue to be delivered. So that investment in education, in policing, in nursing, in new GP appointments in new hospitals and so on, that will continue to be honoured and that is something that is very personal. I think to this government, because it was the pledge that was made once we'd taken the pain of those years of sorting things out. So on the cusp of starting our new economic challenge, we're making good on the old promises. But then the third thing, and this I think is the really interesting point for businesses, is the delivering record investment in infrastructure. And what that's going to do is to spend 100 billion. Now, I've not yet managed to work out what of it is new pledges versus what of it is kind of recycling old pledges. And you always do need to look in um, Treasury uh, red books about uh, where, where exactly that's coming from and have we announced this previously. But it does mean a real focus on roads, railways, broadband, new home building um, and and various products such as a levelling up the green agenda. So um, record investment in infrastructure, that is going to be an opportunity where we all as um, supporters of businesses have the opportunity to kind of jump on that bandwagon. So uh, there will be government spending and more importantly, the, the government will be setting out the challenges for businesses to be able to take advantage of. And so what do I mean by that? Well, having been Secretary of State for Bayes until February this year, one of the things I did whilst there was to re-establish the strategy for business, energy and industrial strategy, very much around number one, decarbonisation, leading the world in tackling global climate change. Not necessarily or not only because it's the right thing for the planet, but also because that's where the UK can make our way in the future. And I think what's interesting is that the government's 10 point green plan very much leans into that, into looking at how can we build our exports, our levelling up agenda around the United Kingdom, but also our successful businesses through using the green economy. And there's huge opportunity from that. So I come from financial services. It employs two million people. It's the star in the crown of the United Kingdom overseas and at home. But it is fairly limited. You know, most people who go into financial services have are highly qualified and perhaps you know tend to come from a particular demographic, etc. The beauty of the green economy is it spreads right across the economy. There's opportunities for everyone, right from green apprenticeships in solar panel installation, and electric infrastructure, home insulation, and so on, all the way up to brilliant science in nuclear fusion, small modular reactors, some of the amazing um, work that's going on to build carbon capture and storage, looking at early stage hydrogen use and so on. So there's a lot of opportunities from the green economy, but also for businesses, there's the opportunity to decarbonize themselves and to start to um, amend their own product offering to, to make their carbon footprint lower and to steal a march on overseas businesses that aren't doing the same. So that's one aspect of Bayes's 
new strategy. And you can see that reflected in where the government wants to go. The second one is tackling the grand challenges. Now, those grand challenges, I know a lot of the group on this call are involved with themselves. And that is things like artificial intelligence, robotics, space, life sciences, some of the amazing grand challenges that face the world and where the UK really is leading. And in this area, uh, the, the government has announced a new enormous investment, 800 million in a new ARPA style of um, untargeted investment in new scientific ideas. So that's at the very sort of top level of coming up with things that we didn't know we needed. Then you've got UKRI, the Research and Development Institutes, that are doing so much to try and promote and invest in university research and then develop it into investment. And that's where you all come in. And when I was business secretary, it was very clear to me, we're very good at the R and not so good at the I. So the research we're great at, the investment we're not so good at. We don't have the right level of investment coming from the city or from venture capitalists. We tend to sell out rather than grow our own brilliant ideas here at home. And of course, there's not enough government support for those who want to get into new innovation. So that's something that is a real and significant challenge that um, the business department with the Treasury are determined to get into. And then the third thing, something I know you've been talking about today, our third mission as government is making the UK the best place in the world to grow a business and to be employed by a business. So that says something about corporate governance, about support for businesses, for know-how and for funding and for uh, things like the place, the, uh, the best in the business, the place to be and so on. So mutual peer support, such as we see through the Silverstone Technology Cluster, but also making it a good place to work. So flexible work is standard. And during the coronavirus pandemic, I think we've seen almost tested to destruction of necessity, how feasible it is to actually work from home, to manage different work-life challenges, and actually to remain productive. So there's no doubt that top line, one of the biggest challenges for the UK economy remains productivity. It's that one thing that has really eluded us so far. And it will be interesting to see whether more flexible work, some of the investment that businesses have made and will make in order to meet either the grand challenges, to make take advantage of artificial intelligence, robotics, and so many of the new innovations, or indeed whether new businesses coming on stream of necessity from those who've sadly lost their jobs during the pandemic, whether actually we can finally sort out our productivity puzzle and start to compete with, I'm ashamed to say, even France in terms of productivity per capita. So there are enormous challenges that lie ahead of us. And um, so I've gone through the spending review yesterday and the highlights from that. So sorting out the pandemic, making good on election pledges on public services and investing in infrastructure. I've talked a bit about where the business department is seeking to go in leading global climate change, investing in the green economy, investing in the grand challenges and supporting businesses to become the best place in the world to grow a business or to be employed. And then the final thing I just want to touch on, and that is Brexit, because I think a lot of people are very concerned about that. The clear decision was taken to leave the EU. And in fact, as you know, we have left the EU. I think some journalists forget they think it's going to happen this December. In fact, it happened at the end of January. And what we're looking at now is the terms of a potential pre-trade deal with the EU. I deeply regret that it's not already signed and sealed. I certainly tried to set out um, in my time in Bayes that we should have a cutoff period at least at the end of October so that businesses could prepare for whatever the outcome. But clearly those negotiations are still underway. It's clearly in all of our interests that we do have a free trade deal. And I do remain confident that we'll get one. Things will change, but the preparation for Brexit in all circumstances, for the end of the transition period, are very, very well advanced. So it's simply not the case that should we leave without a free trade deal, we would be leaving on simply WTO terms. There are many bilateral agreements that have been made with the EU on things like travel, on um, deals, on things like um, uh, professional qualifications and uh, the um, use of different services and so on that actually means that we will be leaving 
not with a free trade deal, but with some bilateral agreement. So, you know, that's not an easy point for those who are exporters and so on. But certainly within the UK government, every step has been taken to ensure that flows at the border can happen smoothly, that arrangements have been articulated and could be sorted out at the touch of a button. It is just having the mutual desire on all sides to do that. So I do remain hopeful that we will get that free trade deal. But obviously, time is running short. And we do need, as a UK government and business sector, to deal with whatever those conclusions are on the grounds that we have already left the EU. So the bright future, where do we make our way in the world? We are very much focused on free trade deals with the rest of the world. We've had debates in the last few weeks about a free trade deal with the United States, the successful deal with Japan, uh, the rollover deal with Canada, um, the aspirations for deals with Australia and New Zealand. And so there is a lot of work underway to create new opportunities in new markets. And of course, we know that the UK is already leading the world in so many areas of science and technology with the aspiration to do so in the green economy. So I do think there's a bright future that awaits us. I was impressed by the OBR yesterday saying that the UK government's support for businesses and to avoid people losing their jobs means that we are in a stronger position than many advanced economies in terms of the harm done to our economy. But nevertheless, we've got some big challenges that lie ahead of us. So I'm going to leave it there to allow room for questions. But um, thank you all very much for listening and for being here. OK, have we any questions? Thank you so much, uh, Andrea. That was a really great uh, synopsis of those sort of three key points that you picked out. Um, First question that's come through is, um, can you outline the steps taken with legislation over the last few years to give out, uh, to give our businesses a competitive edge? Legislation, well, gosh, there's been so much of it. So every Queen's speech, which is roughly every year, you have about 36 different legislative measures. And every single one of those, um, you know, with some exceptions, would have an impact on business. So, for example, if it's a if it's an immigration bill, it'll have an impact on access to employment. If it's a, um, a strictly business bill, so like the one that we're bringing through Parliament at the moment, the National Security and Investment Bill, that has an impact on protecting UK IP from hostile takeovers, from perhaps hostile military takeovers, or indeed stealing IP. So, so, that, you know, so it would be very difficult for me to, other than sort of taking the entire list of every piece of legislation, it would be difficult for me to articulate precisely what it is. But suffice to say that you know, having been leader of the Commons, I presided over about 650 pieces of legislation, a lot of primary legislation, about 60 different pieces of primary legislation, and the rest was secondary legislation, which again, they are, if you like, the rules around the primary legislation, and very often they're introduced for things like um, how you collaborate on interconnectors with uh, the energy supply and so on. So I I'm happy to answer. If, you if you've got something specific, if you've got an area that yeah. you're interested in, then I can try and answer in more detail. But suffice yeah. to say that um, I chaired the Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee for two years, and every piece of legislation has an impact assessment. And in that impact assessment is a financial and more mm -hmm. lateral assessment of the impact on business. So if your question is coming from the point of view of you don't think government does much for business, I hope I can disabuse you of that, because certainly every impact assessment looks at what will this do to businesses. Absolutely. I think I think the one particularly uh, you said which one would be interesting, I think the satellite piece is of particular interest to this group, uh, which I think did go through when you were at Bayes, I, I seem to remember. But yeah. if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, that one I think is a quite a, a good example, actually. Yeah, so the, um, the, the one that I um, took through as leader of the Commons was the space bill. It was, uh, I forget what it was called now, but essentially what it was doing was setting up a regulatory environment in order to encourage the UK to become, if you like, the European centre for commercial satellite technology, for, um, you know, potentially um, private flights to the moon or whatever might come of it. But essentially to take advantage for the UK 
of the enormous opportunities of space. And the point was that if you don't have a re regulatory environment, then you have the Wild West. And so if you're looking to attract investment, you will struggle unless investors can see that there's some sort of clear logic to it, some protection, some rules around it and so on. So in a nutshell, that, that was the point of that bill. Absolutely, I think, I think that was a great example. Um, I've got a question from Alex at Sharp Labs. Um, we talked earlier on about buying British as one of the trends um, in terms of looking at supply chain management post COVID. Um, and we really wanted to ask, um, should we expect the government also to be buying British and should we be encouraging other businesses in the same way to, as we restructure our supply chains after COVID uh, as, a, as a, a, a very important step to recovery? So that is actually a great question. So kind of I grew up on Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which basically said that it's international trade. The more you trade, the more sort of broadly you trade, the wealthier everybody becomes. There's a sort of tide of improvement for all. So on that basis, I'm a big proponent of global free trade. So but having said that, clearly, not necessarily COVID, but what the Brexit debate demonstrated was the complexity of global supply chains. And where actually, if you lose a link in the chain because you've just removed the non-tariff barriers and created friction at the border, that actually then makes it very, very difficult to maintain those very global supply chains. And I can tell you that um, as DEFRA Secretary of State, it was extraordinary to look at things like the journey of a piece of scampi that might be fished for in French waters, landed at Peterhead in Scotland, frozen in Grimsby, sent to China for shelling, brought back to Hull for covering in bread, and then breaded scampi on the shelves, you know, across the UK. I mean, it was extraordinary to, to think of the journey just of a piece of scampi. So I think the lesson learnt has been to decomplexify, what's the word, to decomplicate supply chains. And mm -hmm. I, I also recall, in fact, um, a very telling um, business uh, round table that I had up in um, Sunderland with this um, guy who was a, a contract manufacturer, so made stuff for what, you know, from toothpicks to kind of, you know, Apple iPhone cases to, you know, parts for JCB diggers, whatever you want. And he was saying to me that he had looked for clients all around the European Union and he had this huge business built on the back of global sort of EU wide orders. And when he looked as though he was going to have tariffs and potential problems at the border, what he did was pick up the yellow pages and start calling JC Bamford and um, Jaguar Land Rover and, you know, and, and um, Burberry and big UK names and was astonished. He said it was amazing because I'd never really thought about the potential of the UK. So in a sense, it's been a learning curve for everyone. And I think coronavirus has actually amplified that because a lot of businesses have really struggled to get their supply chains to work because of lockdowns in various parts around the world. So I'm going to give you a really bad answer to that and say my heart is in global trade, but my head is in the practicality of global supply chains in a world that is changing. However, I do think to the end of your question about should the UK look at UK procurement, um, so should the government, sorry, look at UK wide procurement, I think yes, definitely. And I think again, that is about the procurement processes when you tried to have EU wide procurement were ridiculous. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just so complicated. And what that did was to exclude SMEs from the ability or the desire, frankly, because SMEs have too, too much on their plates already. And so the clear feedback was these EU-wide procurement is just not worth my time and trouble. So yes, I do think that we can actually make more sense of, make streamline, make it easier for UK, particularly SMEs, to bid for government contracts. And that would be a good thing. Yes, thank you. That was uh, very very useful. So moving on, um, earlier on today, we had a, a very good um, presentation from Matex from uh, Hannah Ingram Moore talking about uh, diversity, diversity in the workplace. And one of the questions which has come from Anna Stanley at Annika Digital was, with more working at home, is there a backward step here for women as we've been loaded up with childcare and domestic duties? And is there any help plan to level up maternity and paternity care? help maybe for child fees in addition to the current schemes as the cost of childcare is now often higher than the amount of money many women make in a day. 
Yeah, that is exactly the question I asked Liz Truss in Women in Equalities Questions yesterday, exactly that question. So thanks for raising that here. Um, I have to say, I didn't get the most satisfactory answer. Um, and, and it is the fundamental issue. So the question I was asking her is for women who've had a baby in or around lockdown, who are now trying to get back to work and are still remotely working, having sort of had six months potentially with the baby, trying to sort of share juggling baby with, you know, partner, trying to allow them a bit of quiet and space to carry on working, and now are trying to go back to work themselves. How are they supposed to manage? So the answer came back that... Um, that Liz Truss in her women in equalities job is working with Bayes, so Alok Sharma now, um, on exactly that issue. What more can we do to provide parents with access to childcare places and so on? But of course, the real clever thing would be to provide people with care, um, potentially with more childminders and so on. So I have a very particular interest in this area. I'm currently chairing a um, early years healthy development review for the Prime Minister and I do intend to make some comments about that although actually it has been excluded from the remit of my um, of my review I wonder why uh, but ultimately it seems to me that juggling having to keep the baby or the toddler or the school child at home then the childcare we know will fall, not always, but very often predominantly on the mum. And if she is also trying to work, her productivity goes down. So bearing in mind everything I said at the start, we need productivity to increase. And in order to be able to do that, we need to support families better. So it's something I completely agree with you. I'm not sure that there are clear answers as yet, but um, what I would like to see is a much bigger focus on flexible childcare support. So instead of just tax-free, I would like to see parents able to decide when they take advantage of a budget for childcare so that it works better for them. Thank you. That's very interesting, Andrew. And, and then a, a local one, which we're all interested in, as you can imagine. Um, can you confirm where we are with the infrastructure investment in terms of the Camcock, Camcock's Arc? Uh, project, the Cambridge to Oxfordshire Arc, um, which has been much talked about and, and where that currently is in people's thinking. Yeah, I mean, that that's quite interesting from the levelling up perspective, because um, this £4 billion fund that was announced yesterday, um, again, it was only announced yesterday and the devil is always in the detail. Um, but there is a strong case to say that it can't all go to the north of England. And actually, in terms of the levels of deprivation along the um, that arc um, does exist and actually would be incredibly um, resolved in a way by a successful new project to both grow the business sector as well as the infrastructure in that area between you know Oxford to Cambridge taking in Milton Keynes and so on so um it's as a matter of fact where it is is that it's just being put forward to government with sponsorship from all of the councils in the area I've fed into the councils that I think they should be separately asking MPs to support it um I've not personally been asked to come forward and support it but I have offered to get involved with sort of explaining it to ministers and sort of pitching for it and what's interesting with this levelling up four billion fund is that it is uh, going to be something that does require the support of members of parliament so I do think that what you're going to see is a lot of um, now MPs starting to look in their area at what sort of bids they will want to make and so that could be one where MPs get together and, and pitch for it to be taken forward much more seriously than it has been so far. I think that's very helpful, Andrew. And actually, we have got a number of um, local councillors and LEP members on the um, call today. So I think we'll all take note of that because that's very pertinent, obviously, to the Silverstone Cluster. It's something we want to come off as part of, as you say, the investments. So um, a final question here that I have from you comes from Steve Gibson, um, which is around FDI, so the foreign um, investments. Um, can we expect more alignment between government departments and keeping and attracting that FDI into the UK as we move forward with the Brexit plans? Yeah, I mean, the whole, um, the Brexit preparations for no deal. And, you know, I'm very conscious that many of you may have, um, you know, not wanted to leave the EU. But what I would say, having been very closely involved on this cabinet subcommittee called XO, chaired by Michael Gove, 
um, preparing for a no deal Brexit has done the most amazing thing for government is it has forced government departments to very much work together in a kind of COBRA style environment. So COBRA, the Cabinet Office Briefing Room, is the code name for handling an emergency. And how it works is that all of the relevant secretaries of state are brought together into the Cabinet Office Briefing Room and they kind of live scenario and live agree, how are we going to do things? And what happened was EXO was run along those lines. And so it's enabled a huge amount of mutual understanding between different departments, focusing on, first of all, the practicalities of what happens if there's a no deal exit and we get queues of lorries at the border and we need to have places for them to sort out their paperwork before they hold up this whole row of people who've got their paperwork sorted, if you see what I mean. What do we do if there's huge queues because in France they won't allow UK passport holders to go through the you know, the sort of the fast track, blah, blah, blah. So you can imagine the sort of micro details, you know, how do we get our par our pets to go to Spain with us on holiday, that sort of thing. But the much bigger picture is how do we keep the UK together? You know, how do we keep the devolved administrations on side? How do we ensure that um, the UK isn't uh, seen as, a, oh, well, they've left the EU, let's invest in the EU and leave the UK out. So actually all of these questions have been asked and resolutions have been made about them but in a sense, even by dint of asking the questions, it's given us, it's given government some real areas to focus on. And so the creation of the Department for International Trade, in itself the result of the decision to leave the EU, it didn't exist prior to that, has really focused minds on attracting inward investment, but also, I might say, on protecting UK IP and enabling UK companies to grow more at home. So it's really focus the minds on both inward and outward investment. And, and so in answer to your question, I would say there will be a greater focus. So that I hope that was helpful in just explaining the, the, the processes around which we've, we've sort of come to a new place. That was very helpful. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, and that concludes our time with you today. Thank you once again for sparing the time to talk to us here at the Silverstone Cluster. It was really useful. Um, and very, uh, we've asked a lot of questions across a wide range of uh, subjects. They're very useful for us as well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Not at all. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we now move on to uh, one of our other um, speakers, which is Joanna Len uh, Lenkova. Uh, Joanna basically is going to be talking about changing future thinking. It's a thought leadership piece and about how we might go around doing that. Uh, Joanna is part of the Future Forwards organisation um, and I think actually this is a, a good way to conclude our uh, speakers for the day. So Joanna, I am now handing over to you and thank you. Hi everyone and welcome to my session. I hope you have enjoyed the presentation so far. I know I have and I'm also hoping that you are looking forward to this presentation as well. Uh, my name is Joanna Lenkova. I'm a London-based strategist and futurist and today we will speak about a very exciting topic what is future thinking and strategic foresight we will also look at how to practice it to spot future opportunities and build resilient strategies for your organization so let's begin by talking about the living company in the 1980s Ayr de Goose embarked on a journey to find companies older than the Royal Dutch Shell, which at the time was nearing its 100-year anniversary. He was leading the scenario planning team of the company at the time, and of course, Shell is one of the most famous examples of successfully deploying foresight and not only avoiding, but also profiting from the oil crisis of the 70s. So during his research, he found 27 companies and studied them to better understand what makes them successful and long-living. Two of the oldest recorded companies he found were the Sumitomo Corporation and Stora Enso. And as you can see, they have been around for centuries and during their time, they have evolved and even changed what industries they operate in, but they're still living and thriving today. So what makes these companies so successful and what can we learn from them considering that the average lifespan of a company today is only around 20 years. While doing his research, Ari de Goose, um, 
extracted several key traits that the so-called living company must possess. These three traits are also traits of strategic foresight. So the first one is clear awareness of the company's identity, sensitivity to the world around, and high tolerance to new ideas. So what is future thinking and strategic foresight and why is it so important for our strategy? Future thinking is the mindset and strategic foresight is the methodology that we use to identify threats, not only threats, but also opportunities. And we use them to evaluate the important driving forces in the macro environment that can impact the environment we operate in. They can also help us uh, to select the course of action. And strategic foresight is not a framework or a mindset or a methodology that is used to re replace um, traditional planning, but it's a great way to complement it because it can shine a light on things that traditional linear processes might miss. And let me give you an example. So the way that we do traditional planning is we start from today, we gather historic information um, and data and we extrapolate it to create an official future. In large organizations, of course, the future is also dictated by the financial interests of shareholders and the need to project certain stability for the future. In strategic foresight, we take a slightly different approach. So of course we start from today, we consider all the available data, but we also scan the horizon for the emerging trends and the macro driving forces which could impact the operating environment of our company as well as our consumers. So we work with trends, we create scenarios, and we end up with a scope of different possible futures. We believe that we have to proactively shape the future. So we identify a position for our company within that scope, which is the desired future. And that position can be very, very different to the position that we had in the previous example, which is the so-called official future. And that is basically extrapolated straight line uh, from today. So when we identify the different possible futures and where we would like to take our organization, and this can be even a different industry, then we start planning from that desired future backwards. So we backcast and we identify key milestones which can help us reach that future. And there are many different methodologies by which you can do that and different tools. Um, the one that I use is called Natural Foresight. And we, within that framework, we first look at our unconscious bias. So we all come from different backgrounds and have different values. And it's important to do that because when you practice future thinking, you have to be aware of how your own unconscious biases are impacting the way that you search for information and the way that you draw conclusions from this information. So first you have to be aware of these and then avoiding them when looking for that information. And that's why we say that futures thinking is not an individual sport. It's best done in a group. And the more diverse the group is, the better. So futures thinking requires diversity of thought and that's why it's so important to work together and others can provide a different perspective. They can provide a even challenging perspective, which is even better. Um, so once we have realized the unconscious bias and we have somewhat overcome it through different methods and working in a group, then we start working with trends. So we scan the, the horizon for different emerging trends. And one thing to remember here is that since trends are things that are already emerging on the horizon and everyone can purchase a report, a trend report, even your competitors, what is important is what we do with these trends. So we look for the underlying causes that created them and 
we start clashing the different trends and seeing what the implications of these clashes may lead us to. Um, and we call this pattern recognition. So we start to recognize different patterns. Of course, there are many different tools that we go through before we build the actual scenarios. And usually the scenarios are at least three that can give us three different future possibilities. Um, so when we, when we write the different possible scenarios, it is not where we stop. And sometimes some organizations make this mistake. They, they believe that futures thinking and strategic foresight, they stop at scenario building. We have these amazing narratives of future worlds, which are at least 10 years away from, from where we are now. And then we miss the link with the actual strategic planning. So it's very important, once we have this information about the future, to continue using the tools that are available in the tool set of foresight and strategy, and to go through the backcasting, to identify the different milestones that are going to take us to, to that desired future, and then start to implement actions within our strategies, understand which strategies that we currently have are resilient enough to survive in any of the future worlds, and perhaps make some slight changes or create new strategies that will allow us to do that. One thing I wanted to mention here is that in order to have a robust view of the emerging trends and patterns, because yes, we, you know, identifying the trends, it's, it's in the beginning of, of, of the work that we do as futurists. Uh, it's important to select the right trends and select the right emerging patterns. So in order to have a robust view of these trends, you should always look across different categories and well beyond your industry, because Think about it. Disruptions usually come from outside the industry. So if you are very focused on technology, make sure you're looking at all the rest of the steep categories. So make sure you're interested in the social, environmental, economic, and political areas, because this is, this, these categories, they make up the world that we're living in. We're not isolated. We don't live in one of these categories. And as I said before, disruption comes across from, from other industries. So if you want to be a disruptor, it's a great opportunity for you as well to understand how technology is going to impact any of the other areas and where the next opportunity for you may be. I mentioned earlier that Shell is one of the most famous examples uh, for, of an organization successfully implementing scenario planning. And here they have worked on the future of energy um, in 2070. So you can see how far in advance <laughs> they're looking. And also, please note the question that they're asking. They're not asking, what is the future of oil? They're asking, what is the future of energy? So when we are looking for focal issues and when we're looking for um, to work with future scenarios, we also have to be mindful of the fact that we have to ask the right questions. And we shouldn't limit ourselves only within our sphere of influence right now. So, even though strategic foresight is used in large organizations, it's also used by startups, by NGOs, as well as governments. And for example, Singapore and Dubai are very good examples of that. And I have been noticing that more and more organizations are interested in strategic foresight, particularly now, because we live in such, a, such an uncertain time at the moment. And one example of successfully implementing strategic foresight that I can give from a personal experience is um, the, my experience from the Walt Disney Company where I worked as a strategist, but I also led the futures team uh, for the UK. So in, in, in the, within the Walt Disney Company, the whole project started perhaps more than 10 years ago when one of the executives of um, the Walt uh, Disney International asked their HR uh, team to consider the fact that with all the automation that is coming our way, what is going to be what is going to be the talent that is going to be needed in the future? So what began as a works, workforce of the future project quickly turned into an organization-wide foresight competency development. And there were over 500 people trained across 10 geographic regions, across 15 different teams. And the way that it was organized there, it ran more on the background. So it wasn't, there wasn't a particular team that was separated and tasked to work on strategic foresight. It was 
a training that was given to different people with different roles. So for example, in, in my team, we had myself coming from strategy, we had someone from finance, we had someone from someone who was a lawyer, someone from the creative side of things, many different people and many different levels because in, innovative ideas and great ideas don't always come from the top, no matter how much we want to believe that when, when we are a leader. It's important to have this diversity and this is, this is how it was organized uh, within the Walt Disney Company. Another example of deploying scenario planning and strategic foresight tools, and of course scenario planning is probably the most famous tool of, of strategic foresight, but there are many different tools that can be used at different occasions because scenarios can take a very long time uh, to, to really, if you would like to develop a robust set of scenarios. But Rolls-Royce is a company that uses future thinking and with them it kind of came as a necessity. So in 2014, there was the perfect storm. So there was a decline in wide body airline orders, the Chinese economy growth rate slowed down, um, the end of the commodities boom came, oil price declined, and on top of it all, the Fukushima disaster happened. So all things that are unrelated, some of them very much unforeseen, and this really impacted all of Rolls-Royce's businesses. And in 2015, their share price fell by 50%, and there was a, some serious talk about dismantling the company and selling off parts of the company. So a new CEO came, and in 2016, the leadership participated in a scenario planning workshop. They sat together and they imagined the future in 2040. And you see how different it is than having 500 people within the organization trained in the whole um, in the whole tool set and in the whole futures thinking to just having a one-off workshop, a week-long exercise. And with Rolls-Royce, the way that they use these scenarios, of course, these scenarios need to be updated from time to time to kind of reflect the new trends that we see on the horizon and the new reality that is emerging. But they're still valid and the way that they use them is they sense check their strategies against the scenarios to see whether the strategies are robust and relevant. And of course, they use them as a determining factor when taking some serious investment decisions. And of course, I'm here to talk about the future and I'm here to talk about strategic foresight. And I already said that I, I'm noticing a, a stronger interest now that uh, there are some disruptive, disruptive forces, and a lot of organizations were not prepared. Of course, many others um, fell within within the lucky ones who whose businesses um, are more resilient in this current situation. But I keep on wondering what would have happened if the the pandemic was a different kind of pandemic, and would would that have impacted the businesses that are successful now? So. I think that in our volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world, all of us should know, we should practice futures thinking and should know how to work with, um, with trends, with scenarios, and really consider the scope of opportunities that the future holds to be able to build more resilient strategies and be prepared for the uncertainty and the complexity that our world really um, presents us with. And of course, I would like to finish my presentation with a thought um, of Einstein. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share further if anyone else is interested in the strategic foresight, in the methodology, in the tools. I am available. Thank you very much for the attention and I hope to speak to you soon. Thank you very much indeed, Joanna. Um, we have got time to just pose a few questions to you if that's okay. Um, so I'm just seeing if anything's come through and uh, whilst we are doing that, I think you are in the process of writing a book on this particular subject. Um, how, how is that book going? If it's something that we want to get our hands on to have a read of. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you, Helen. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm very excited. This is going to be my first book. Um, and the reason for the book is that I have faced many questions from different types of companies, particularly now um, when I'm working for my consultancy. I work with different cl clients ac across the world and they're facing similar issues and similar, similar problems. And I feel that a book that can give them the tools, but also examples from how other companies or NGOs or governments have, deal have dealt with uncertain situation would be very helpful. What is interesting about this book though, is that it is a business strategy book. However, it's going to be an interactive book. So the plot is going to be a type of choose your own adventure book where you are going to be at the driver's seat as a reader. Um, and you will take your organization through different challenges and answer sort of real life questions. And at the end, um, depending on your choices, and, and of course you'll get tools that can help you take informed decisions. At the end, depending on your choices, you will end um, in one of three different possible worlds. So <laughs> that's the, that's the <laughs> interesting part of the, <laughs> of, of the book. So it's not a strategy book, it's, it's more interactive. <laughs> that sounds fascinating, Joanna. So, so another question here is, we're planning ahead for the future, what advice would you give to businesses on how to handle or account for unexpected events such as the pandemic? I think we've all felt that. How do we plan for that? Yeah, well, I think that's the essence of future thinking, of scenario planning. I think we are not able to predict the future, and that's definitely not the point of a strategic foresight. Um, it's it's a good methodology uh, to to have in your toolkit to be able to go through a process of thinking about the future long-term and anticipating different outcomes that may appear. Of course, there are events that we call black swan events. Uh, we, you, we could argue whether the pandemic was such an event because there's so many uh, people who have foreseen it. Uh, but the point is not to be planning in a linear way, um, to try to expand our thinking and expand our scope, consider different possibilities and of course, remain create systems within your organization to remain agile and flexible to be able to react to the systems. As I mentioned earlier, in the example of Rolls Royce, for, for example, you can have a strategy now, but if you get informed about future scenarios 10 years further down the line, you are able to use different tools to sense check your strategy, to see whether the strategy is, is resilient. And if it's not, once you've done this exercise, you're able to make slight adjustments. If you haven't done that, then it's difficult to, to adjust. You'll be caught off guard. That, that's really helpful, Joanna. Thank you very much indeed, and lots of food for thought there. Um, what I'm going to do now, so thank you. Thank you for your time today. Um, I'm going to hand back to John Corbett for some closing remarks as we come to the end of what's been a, a really great day. So, John, can I pass over to you now, please? Thanks, Helen, um, and appreciate uh, appreciate the, the introduction again, back handing over. Um, just on behalf of the SGC, um, I'd like to say thank you, obviously, to our, our speakers for today and uh, and also to Helen for, for hosting. Um, in the Bruce Forsyth way, uh, it feels like I should be saying, didn't she do well? But that's probably taken it a little bit too far. So um, anyway, what say what a fantastic day. We've heard some about some fantastic innovation and collaboration and covered some really important thought-provoking topics which are really forward thinking what it really reinforces for me is the unique and special opportunity we have in our region and the Silverson technology cluster it's interesting to hear from Andrea's comments on the, the spending review and the thoughts on the Oxford Cambridge arc um, of course there's been a lot of talk about that subject and the opportunity that presents and the key for me in that is business being fully engaged and playing a pivotal role in developing what we sh what that should look like not waiting um, but prompting action, um, seeing the benefit and engaging in how we, we should develop it. Um, the SDC and you have an important voice in that, so let's not let that pass us by. Um, and as we've alluded to already, the SDC is here to support you. It would be a miss, though, of me not to take the opportunity to mention the reason we at Barclays are involved is that we see a fantastic opportunity to support the long-term growth 
and prosperity for business in our region. Our Barclays Eagle Lab based at Cranfield University is also an endorsement of how important we see our role in supporting businesses with the opportunity for innovation, growth and to scale up. And of course, if you want to know more about how Barclays can support you, then please reach out to me directly or via PIM. But also, earlier this month, we saw uh, the launch of the Central Archangels Group, which uh, STC have provided input into the steering group on. And as the potential to fill a, a gap we identified in our area around angel investor funding. Again, if you want to hear more about that, then reach out to, to Pim or myself um, if you would like more insight, either as an investor or indeed as an investee. Um, and that, again, perhaps gives you a further indication of the messages that you've heard today, which have been about the role the STC is pl playing to support you and sharing some of the opportunities that exist. Now, we know there's a huge amount of uncertainty ahead. As I mentioned in my comments earlier, we just need to figure out the way through it and recognize with the challenges, there also will be opportunity. And from what we've heard today, it really reinforces the role the STC and each of you have in making sure we work together to find that solution. Now, the SDC was established to support 4,000 businesses within the area. And we defined when we defined the Silverstone Technology Cluster. And it was to support them with leadership, thought leadership, collaboration, and promotion of the capabilities we have, which, again, I hope you've had a feel of uh, today. But for those of you who are already members, thank you. And we look forward to continuing to work with you in the future. And for those of you that are not yet members, we look forward to becoming members very soon. So on that note, thank you. I think I'm passing next to Pim. Is that right? Yes, thank you, John. Um, that was great. Um, now, regulars to SEC events will know what's coming next. Um, but before we run a quick feedback poll, um, I just wanted to thank, uh, first of all, Helen for being an, uh, an absolutely excellent compare. Um, I also wanted to thank all of our speakers. Um, I wanted to thank Joanne and Jackie uh, for all their hard work, um, not just for this conference, um, and it has been hard work, um, but also for all their hard work throughout the year, and that's really appreciated. Um, obviously, I'd like to thank all our STC board members as well um, for helping out today. Um, I thought it was a really great team effort, so thank you all very much for your support. Um, thanks as well to our AV support team, um, and of course, uh, thanks to our conference supporters, Silverstone Park, Hexagon, Silverstone Composites, and Wood Pines. Um, now, if we can launch a, a feedback poll, please. Um, could I please ask you all to um, complete this um, and take a couple of minutes to, uh, to do that? Um, it's not only very useful um, to get your feedback on this, on this event, um, but also to get your views on what areas the STC can support you with as well. Uh, it should only take a couple of minutes and it's of tremendous help for us. So uh, I would be really um, appreciative if you, could, uh, if you could do that. Um, so once completed, you're free to go. Um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it enjoyable and valuable. Um, and we hope to see you again at the next event. So thank you very much. <laughs>